Hi guys, welcome and welcome back to the podcast. I've been meaning to watch that. I'm your host, Monica. We are back again. New week, new topic, new guest every single week. And this week we have a very, very special guest with us today. I'm sure if you're a fan of, you know, video essays and commentary videos, you have probably seen his videos on your uh, recommended or possibly in your subscription box. He is someone who is very smart, very funny. Um, honestly, one of my favorite YouTubers. And he is, you know, a snarky British man. So I'm very excited to have him on today. So everyone, please say hi to Owen. Hi. Hello, everyone. Yes. Great to be here. Owen, so happy to have you on. And today, guys, we're going to be talking about Good Omens, the, you know, amazing Amazon Prime show that was adapted by the Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett series. But before we jump into that, we're going to get into our first segment, which is Media Mania, where we talk about new releases and entertainment news. And there are a couple new releases out right now. First of all, there's Challengers, which everyone is talking about, um, Mm. which I have yet to watch, but... Me Hopefully. neither. I haven't seen it either. <laughs> yeah, I, wanna, I so badly want to see it. <laughs> it's so hard because everyone is going to see the movie, but everyone's spoiling it now. So I have to literally like not even go online just to I've avoid seen spoilers. Like, I've, I've seen vibe spoilers. I haven't seen like specific plot spoilers yet. Okay. Like all those memes where it's like, you know, it's the three characters are like three tickets to challenges, please. <laughs> <laughs> those memes are so funny because people are always bringing up like, Mm, the the one that I can think of is the one that Apple TV did with the three characters from Ted Lasso. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always those three characters you see that are in like that weird love triangle. And it's like, three takes the challenges, yeah. please. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there is Abigail and then Rebel Moon 2 came out on Netflix recently, which I forgot mm. about. I also uh, forgot about I I also only found out <laughs> Abigail existed like two days ago. Oh. <laughs> It's 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 a horror movie. Is it a horror movie? Yeah. yeah. It is. I, I, it's a horror comedy. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, think I only found out <laughs> very recently existed. Rebel Moon, I again forgot about. I only know it's because of, everyone was making fun of part one. <laughs> I, remember, yeah. I haven't seen it myself. I think that there's a part three that's supposed to come out soon, but. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe Zack Snyder should just leave that like on the shelf. You know? Yeah. Well, he was so like he released they released like the theatrical cut, didn't they? And then he was like, "And I'm gonna do a director's cut." It's like, mm. why? <laughs> why wouldn't you just release the director? Like a director's cut is what happens when like the studio stops you mm-hmm. from doing it. If the studio wants you to release the director's cut and a theatrical cut, that's not like is that really director's cut at that point? Is it even necessary? Yeah, like, oh, definitely not. <laughs> I think people have to like your film to want a director's cut. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> is, there, is there a bad film that's gotten a director's cut? Not any that I've seen. Yeah. I can't say. <laughs> and I feel like Zack Snyder, I don't know, maybe he lives in like this bubble where he feels like his films are like widely revered and like well liked. Yeah. I guess his fans are pretty like intense to be mm. diplomatic about it <laughs> mm. yeah intense is a nice word yeah <laughs> yeah they're, they're very devoted shall we say absolutely absolutely <laughs> so so i could see why he gets the idea from but um i was never really interested in rebel moon one because like anything Zack snyder makes i feel like it's very like bro and like it's just not yeah, my taste it's just- yeah, no, I get it. I did unfortunately sit through the four hour Justice League <laughs> movie, which was like, it was, it's his best movie. And even then, it's like just okay. I was, I watched the whole thing. And at the end of four hours of my life, I was like, well, that was fine. I, it was, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can recommend it. I, I'm going to be honest, I don't see the point in having a four hour film if it's not really going to change the way the original film was presented. Yeah. It's yeah, it's like better than the original one, but also it's like two more hours of your life. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't do that. It, yeah, no, fully understandable. It was like a waste of a, like almost a full day. Mm-hmm. I feel like the first Zack Snyder film, the first Zack Snyder film I watched was Watchmen, and yeah, that's just because I was a fan of the Watchmen comics when I was younger, and then mm. watching the movie was like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is that, bad. He, yeah. 
he he just fully admitting for like three and a half hours he just didn't understand the original comic mm. and i can understand like the watchman film was made under a studio so of course like studios have like approval on certain things in the yeah. movie and watchman is very much an anti-establishment comic so for you yeah. to make that movie alongside <laughs> a studio is going to like reverse some of the messaging that's in the watchman comics yeah, yeah and everyone was talking about like how good it looked and like you go read the comics like, it looks good because he just like did like a panel for panel remake of like every shot from the comic yeah it's just like a copy and paste mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah not very not very inspired um mm. but those are the new releases i feel like out of all of them i'm definitely gonna watch challengers definitely at, yeah at some point because i can't have anybody spoil it for me like yeah no exactly <laughs> I can't handle it. I have to go watch it. And I feel like that's one of those movies you watch. And you have to watch it over and over and over again. You know? Oh, yeah. Like, they they put this in IMAX. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that means, for, like, a drama, that means they're, like, confident about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, the director is a pretty solid, very talented director. So yeah. It was always going to be a banger. There's no question about no. it. Exactly. With Zendaya, Josh O'Connor, Mike Face as well. It's mm -hmm. like a stacked cast. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, I also did want to talk about Billie Eilish because she yeah. is going to be coming out with a new album, May 17th. Um, it's very interesting. There are a lot of albums coming out, I think. Like, yeah. Billie's is coming out. Taylor Swift just dropped her album. And... Beyonce not too long ago, yeah. Yes, Beyonce not long ago. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people are going on tour. Okay. Yeah, that's true, yeah. It's a big time for music right now. I don't know what's in the air. I think there is this, like, I don't know. This is conspiracy that I've seen on TikTok that certain people might not be as rich as they're saying they are. So they need to go oh, on tour to, like, my. stack up their bread, which I feel like <laughs> might be true for some people. Maybe not, like, Taylor Swift and Beyonce because they're literally billionaires. But yeah. <laughs> I feel like everybody is too broke right now to be, like, thinking about going to concerts. You know. Yeah, especially when like Taylor Swift charges like five. What is it like two hundred and fifty dollars a ticket or something ridiculous like that? I mean, that's in like nosebleed seats. If you want yeah. to be like <laughs> closer, it's like five hundred, seven hundred, even more. God, I know for like don't Renaissance. The prices, sorry, like I was gonna say, don't the prices like go up? Like the fewer tickets there are, as well, isn't it? Like whatever, there's like a name for it, but I can't remember. Yeah, I know with Renaissance, because I was looking at getting tickets for the Atlanta show, um, if you wanted to be like in the VIP area where everyone's standing around the stage, it was like close to $2,000. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> it's, it's like, as the artist gets richer, surely the tickets should get cheaper. Because it's mm -mm. like, they can afford to have like way cheaper tickets. No, 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 no. They make money <laughs> off the tour. They need God. to. <laughs> like when SZA was first um, making music, and I think this was while she was releasing Control. Her tickets were like the most expensive, three hundred dollars. Now you're looking at like possibly a thousand. So, oh God. yeah, it's crazy. To me. <laughs> <laughs> the people who only follow like really, really indie artists have got it made, where it's like twenty bucks for a yeah. front row ticket. Like I want to go see Mitski on tour because apparently she's going on tour as well, but yeah. Um, I'm also worried because the general public has found out who Mitski is and oh yeah I can't pay more than half of my paycheck for these tickets. Yeah. Also people start being like really weird at these shows as well. I've seen videos on TikTok people like like what is it like yelling like mm -hmm. mother at her and like meowing at her and stuff like that when she's like trying to do really emotional songs. She is and thinking it's... about like heartbreak and like loneliness and you guys are yeah. screaming <laughs> mother like <laughs> It's oh my gross. God. It's gross. It's weird. It's a like, yeah. and I don't like it. Yeah, just you can shut up for like three minutes. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing is, like, I was reading this Rolling Stone article, and in the article, Billy like actually does come out as bisexual, which I feel like a lot of people have been. Um, I guess like people have just assumed that she is. Yeah. Because if you're a moody girl with dyed hair, it's like, are you straight? Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's like the presentation as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. From California as well. Yeah. And I think that <laughs> it's, an interesting, it's interesting to look at the dynamic between like 
people who are kind of like pop idols and their fans and how fans yeah. have somehow lost an understanding of like boundaries and decorum or like any kind yeah. of like privacy or courtesy towards these people that they admire that's that's true i that is true and but then i think you also if you go back and look at like how even someone like the beatles mm -hmm. in the 60s they were like people they were all like rock stars in the 80s and stuff that there were also people like ripping at their clothes and trying to like climb in their hotel rooms and things like that mm -hmm. but i definitely think there is i think it's now that there can be like an online invasion of privacy as well i think like i, I think in the interview she talks about like like social media and things like that and it's just very like i get that that's like kind of a new dynamic they have to contend with mm -hmm. I, what i thought was most interesting, like how she didn't have any friends what she talked about like, that she, where she it was just like her 20th birthday party or something she just realized that everyone worked for her because she didn't want anyone to know her beyond kind of billy eilish the persona mm -hmm. which i thought that was really interesting yeah i have to imagine that's pretty hard to deal with and like you said with social media that's an entire new mechanic to factor into someone's like life as being a star mm -hmm. because before even with like the beatles and like people like finding their hotel rooms and stuff the beatles <laughs> were not easily accessible to people at every waking moment of every day and now with yeah. social media there are rumors and blind items and like there's like exclusives and like um exposés being dropped every other week about these celebrities that are super well known yeah. and they can't escape it because your fan will just go, your fans will just go to your Instagram and flood your comments, and then you feel like you have to defend yourself, or you have to feel like you have yeah. to like make a statement and say something. And there's no escaping the public's perception of who you are. Yeah, more every day. I understand why some celebrities just like hand their social media off to like age to like their managers and stuff like that. Because I wouldn't want to deal with that either if I had like 35 million followers. Yeah, yeah. And some celebrities even have social media to begin with, which. Yeah. I can understand as well because a lot of them like Kristen Stewart, Chris Pine, those are just two mm. I can think of right off the bat. Like those are two very well known actors who are beloved by their fans, but if they were so easily accessible, especially Kristen Stewart, if her fans <laughs> could just like hop in her Instagram oh, DMs, yeah, they would not be normal. <laughs> <laughs> especially after Love Lies Bleeding came out, they would be Oh god, yeah. Feral. <laughs> just does Katie O'Brien have an Instagram? Because I'm praying for her. She does. She has a Twitter, which is actually how she got casted in the movie. She tweeted at, I think, Chris Stewart's production company. And she was like, hey, I'd love to work with you guys one day. And that's how she got casted in the movie. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Katie O'Brien is a really great actress. But I, you know, after I watched the movie, I was like, that was an amazing film. But damn. No, I still haven't seen it. I need to see that and Challengers. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Challengers, Love Lies Bleeding, two films that have made me rethink skipping the gym. You know? <laughs> Real? <laughs> yes. Because when you do get to watch Love Lies Bleeding, it's actually like such an amazing film. But once you kind of get past the middle part, because it's an A24 film, things yeah. are getting a little wonky and it's like, Oh my god! Yeah, yeah no, I I saw a gif <laughs> on Twitter of like I don't want to spoil for anything, but it was one of like the really weird scenes in the movie. And I was like, I thought this was like a like dark romance film. Mm. Like, what's going on? Yeah, Obviously, yeah. It doesn't make me want to see any less, to be clear. But like, I was <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I like seeing films where like you cannot really predict what's going to happen. You just have to like lend mm -hmm. yourself to the movie, which I appreciate more because if you give me the whole film in the trailer, then yeah, ten out of ten, I'm not gonna watch it. Gonna keep my ass at home. <laughs> yeah, cinema tickets are expensive these days. <laughs> yeah, like the tour tickets. Yeah, because now I'm thinking going to see Challengers is probably gonna be like twenty five, thirty dollars for me to go watch it in IMAX. But in my head, I'm like, mm. yeah. But I want to <laughs> see the IMAX though, because why is everyone yes. going to see it in IMAX? Yeah. That's as uh, I hate to say it, marketing works. If they all they have to do is stick it <laughs> max, and I'm like, you know what? Now I have to see this because why did they put it in IMAX? Yeah, yeah, and they don't have to do that much marketing. Like, people will go yeah. see Zendaya in any movie, and I feel like the fans are just I don't want to say feral, but like, yeah, hungry. I think, the, yeah, I think the delay helped them as well. Is that it was the fact that it was that one picture of like Zendaya being kissed by both of them. Mm -hmm. And then it got delayed for like, what was it, like six, seven months or something. And that's yeah. all people had. And so there was a lot of time for them to, as you said, go feral. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad that everyone's kind of like losing their minds over the film because I am excited to see it. But at the same time, like sometimes when I see films that people really like, I get worried that I won't like it. 
because I yeah. can't really get into things as deeply as other people do. You know what I mean? Mm. Sometimes people really yeah. like things just because the people that are in it are good. And when I'm looking at it, I'm like, I mean, yeah, I'm happy this person is cast. I'm glad they have a job and a check, but like, <laughs> there are some things that could be changed. And I feel like this movie is not that, which I'm very happy for. <laughs> <laughs> good. Yeah, I know. A good tennis. When was the last like really good tennis movie as well? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, I don't want to say, I mean, I guess King Richard, but like, that's kind of like a. Oh, thing. yeah. That's yeah. true. I heard it. I heard it was one of those films where like Will Smith was good, and then everyone else was just everything else about it was just okay. But I haven't seen it. I think the movie was pretty solid overall, but like me personally, I don't like biopics, so if, uh, I can't really get into them. You know, they all just feel that's the same fair to enough. Me. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but I speaking of movies, because you said this movie was delayed. Another film that's been delayed recently is Craven. Which is oh. the next <laughs> movie in the <laughs> Spider-Man villain multiverse that Sony is oh, pushing? It's what the hell they call it? It's like so. It's like the SSCU or something. The Sony. But I have no. This is the most train wreck cinematic universe <laughs> of all time. I think. I don't know. I I feel like I understand why Craven is being pushed, delayed because. Um, Madam Web. I was about to say Spider Woman. That's not the movie. Madam <laughs> Web was also like not that great due to yeah. like, reshoots, rewrites. I don't care. It wasn't a great movie. And now yeah. like, the White Panther is being delayed until Christmas. <laughs> so I th it might have something to do with because I know Craven was the villain in the Spider Man Two video game. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's. I don't know if they're like intimidated by like they think that Craven is worse than that one. That I don't know if that's a factor. I don't but, know because they also push back Karate Kid. That's true. Yes. I think I think that they're, they're scrambling so badly. When was the last like successful Sony movie? I guess like across the Spider Verse, but I mean like live action Sony movie. I'm trying to think. Have they had any wins this year? If you're talking about like a Sony like superhero movie, you can't really say because like oh. I would say Venom, but that's just because I like that series. If you look at it from uh, like a critical standpoint. Yeah. Um, a commercial standpoint that movie is also a flop yeah yeah what was it it's venom then venom let there be carnage then madam web and now crave <laughs> yeah it's, it's the bright idea to do a spider-man movies without spider-man <laughs> because you know the villains are just as important they're just as interesting <laughs> No, they're not. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, especially not craven the hunter of all the spider-man villains you could get you get like the hunter guy mm-hmm I don't understand. You have like the aliens, even like Madam Web is like a in relatively interesting concept, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you know, she can see the future and stuff like that. It's just that the execution was bad. Yeah. But Craven, the hunt, Craven is just like a guy who goes around and hunts things. It feels I don't think like... that's. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna, compared to like something like Venom, like the alien, right. it's not like that gripping of a concept. Also, Venom is interesting because you have the. Um, you already kind of understand who Venom is from like Spider-Man 2 from yeah. Maguire Spider-Man mm. and I think that a lot of people like Spider Venom me personally this is what I think a lot of people like Venom because some people are secretly monster fuckers or they want to be and so, oh yeah <laughs> and not also, so secret these days but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also like homoerotic subtext in the movie kind of like helped yeah. a little bit and then they leaned into it in like Venom 2 but like Craven feels like you're watching a guy who would watch Liver King videos unironically. Yeah, he feels like he would have a podcast. Mm -hmm. he's, he's like the Joe Rogan of mm -hmm. Spider-Man. The like Joe yeah. Rogan if he was a Spider-Man villain. Also, Venom has helped so much that Tom Hardy like goes for it completely. He could have just like phoned that in for a check. Mm -hmm. But he like he's you can tell he's actually like putting effort into it. I think that really carries the movies. Yeah. Which I find surprising because I only know Tom Hardy from inception and peaky blinders so seeing him yeah. in the superhero movie was like oh this is interesting and then watching yeah. venom i was like this is such a different <laughs> this is so different <laughs> for you but i enjoy it so much yeah. like i remember he was bane in dark knight rises as well but he had like the mask on and everything right <laughs> yeah he's used to playing like very dark stoic like i guess you could say like manly characters and it's not that like uh, eddie brock isn't manly but like when you're in your sweat yeah. soaked in sweat sitting in a lobster tank you look kind of pathetic yeah you know what i mean he's a, 
Yeah, he's not afraid to be look like busted as hell on screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And then there's Aaron Taylor Johnson who looks ripped as hell. Running yeah, he through looked... like the Sahara. I yeah. Think. I was gonna say, this is meant to be a guy who like hangs out in the wilderness all the time, but he's like perfectly like made up and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that this is like Craven the Hunter. This looks like a guy in cosplay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like a strong movie. I think that like there may be some people that resonate with the film, but I feel like there's that there's obviously that crowd of like comic movie fans that prefer yeah. the original Marvel. So I yeah. think that they'll attach themselves to this Craven and be like, see. This is how you do superhero movies. This is a real superhero yeah. movie, you know. Like this is I what just realized this, I just realized when we were listing all that we forgot about Morbius. <laughs> and the the, so, the Spider-Man films. We forgot about oh the Morbius God. movie. I mean, <laughs> thank God that we did cuz I don't want to think about that movie. Yeah, no, neither do I to be honest. <laughs> I think Sony doesn't want to either. I remember even when they like announced that they were going to do a Morbius film with Jared Leto. I feel like the resounding, yeah. like, response was like, but why, though? Yeah. Who asked Why would that? you? Yeah. I would, the strangest post credit scene of all time as well. <laughs> <laughs> the Michael Keaton, like, who I don't even think was, like, there on set. I think he literally, like, dialed it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There's something going on at Sony. Also, DCU. Mm. Like, just the fact oh, that God, DCU. Yeah. I think he, James Gunn has, like, kind of stop making DC movies for now he's gonna like restart the universe and yeah I think with but Superman, the, uh, super, which, yeah Superman whatever they're calling it I think it's just yes. the Superman or something like that there might be another title but I know they're filming it now yeah. I oh just, it was Superman Legacy and I think they changed it to something <laughs> yeah I I don't know me personally I understand why you want to go with like well-known superhero characters like that makes sense it's something yeah. that people are already people already know it's easy to introduce to the audience but yeah. i feel like something different would be better like me personally i like blue beetle even though like yeah. nobody went to go see it but like I, 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 I still need to see that but i heard it was good yeah it's a good movie it's very fun it's very funny um but i feel like doing like superman doing batman it's just like it's so tired yeah, yeah, I know. It's actually embarrassing that like Marvel, when they started the MCU, they had like the, no rights to any of their like known characters at that mm -hmm. time, and DC had like the rights to everyone, and they still managed to flop, and the MCU became the big one. Yeah. If if Superman Legacy fails, I legit don't think we're going to see another DC movie for like five years. <laughs> it's good. like it's actually over for them for like a while if this if Superman and the new Superman movie bombs. James Gunn the other day did post a picture of the Green Lantern, like the Green Lantern fist and the ring yeah. like shining through. So I guess that was kind yeah. of like a nod to people be like, hey. I, yeah. I, I hope it's not like the, um, what was it, Batman v Superman, where they have that one yeah. scene where like one just like clicks through every single Justice League member. And it's like, is this, why, why are we trying to do like the setup movie that is the second one? Mm hmm. I hope it's not. I hope they just if they I hope they just do like a Superman movie and don't try to do like Justice League Part One. Yeah, to be honest, I have faith in James Gunn tentatively. Yeah, just because I have, like yeah. No, you go ahead. I, no, I was because I have more faith in James Gunn than Zack Snyder. <laughs> <I'll say that>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like, the Suicide Squad was good. It was a good movie. Yeah, valid, and also like Guardians of the Galaxy was good. Hmm. Oh, that's, yeah, all solid movies. Yeah, all solid movies. And, you know, he seems to be someone who has an eye or, in, like, a genuine interest in a comic books. And the fact that he is, mm -hmm. like, at the helm of DC yeah. gives you some confidence that he will, like, know what to do. And the fact that, like, Marvel is struggling right now with, like, trying to get yeah. like, films, TV shows, like, audiences interested in their content again he yeah now can like understand what's going wrong there and be sure not to do that with his own productions you know yeah hopefully we we pray <laughs> yeah i mean we'll just have to wait and see i he's not really someone who like does a lot of interviews like every so often but um yeah. i feel like i can you know have a little bit of faith in james gunn that he will know what he's doing you know yeah, 
I think we'll at least we'll, we'll get like I think at worst it will be like a good not great movie. Mm-hmm. That's not the worst. I don't expect it to be like awful. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We might surprise us. Hopefully he does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, one thing that wasn't a surprise was how great Good Omens was as an adaptation, guys. <laughs> we're gonna yeah. dive into the <laughs> critically acclaimed Amazon Prime TV show Good Omens, which is a show based off the '90s novel written by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. Um, it was adapted, I believe, in 2016, and it was something that was a labor of love for Neil Gaiman because of the passing of his friend Terry Pratchett and Owen and I are going to kind of like talk about our thoughts on season one and season two uh, just kind of giving you guys a brief overview so obviously there will be spoilers up ahead for good omens uh, but my first initial thoughts of course was that I love the show because as a Doctor Who fan I'll <laughs> watch anything that David Tennant is in and I had an understanding of who Neil Gaiman was just from Tumblr, and yeah, I, he's very active on Tumblr. Mm, yeah. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> when I saw the show and I recognized Michael Sheed, who was also in Twilight, I was like, "Oh, I know that guy. Okay, <laughs> this will be fun." And it was. It was a fun show. It's an amazing show. Um, as someone who's also like a huge fan of, I love anything adapted to Christian theology, like. Lucifer, Supernatural, Good Omens, mm. that's that's my shit right there. So I was genuinely yeah. a fan of the show. Um, Owen, how did you start watching the show? And like, do you like it? Do you love it? Is it like okay to you? <clears throat> so I start watching, I think I've also, this is where I confess, I've never read like a single Neil Gaiman book, mm-hmm. like ever. I've watched a lot of the adaptions of his stuff. So I've seen like Coraline and things like that, but I've never actually sat down and watched books. So I wasn't, I can't remember, God, it's a real while ago i think it was just that it started getting popular on i think it was on places like tumblr and stuff like that and i knew david Tennant, michael sheen um from sort of other stuff as well of course doctor who i know michael this is where i was at michael sheen was also in doctor who i think he was in he was the a voice of one of the villains in like series six but they really like messed up his voice you remember the the one where it's like amy and rory like trapped in the tardis and it's like the like the evil voice yeah that's michael sheen like doing the voice yeah they like they like pitched his voice way down but that's him so yeah no as uh, just like you i love the show i mean that's why i stuck around for season two as well but uh, i'd uh, in terms of like the adaption of it and like how good of adaption it is i'm not really like sure about all that because i just came in i think like like just as a show fan but as a show fan, yeah, <laughs> I really liked it. I do like the Christian theology elements. I do like sort of playing around with the kind of conceptions of like heaven and hell and mm-hmm. like the very binary good and evil and Armageddon and things like that. I think that's something that recurs quite a lot in your know, game's works from what I know of them. Yeah. And I think that um, with season one, there are a lot of fans of the books that kind of came out and they were talking about how much they liked the adaptation because when the book first came out, they had tried to adapt it, I believe, into a film. But um, yeah. around the time that it was going to be adapted into the film, 9-11 happened. So then they were like, oh, American audiences do not want something about an apocalypse. <laughs> so oh. it's the wayside. Yeah. yeah not not a very happy story (laughs) um so then i believe that like terry pratchett really pushed for neil gaiman to make this adaptation because he wanted to see like what it would look like he wanted to watch it yeah and neil gaiman was someone who's like i like adaptations i'm okay with them but i can't really trust it's going to happen until i'm like sitting there watching it and terry pratchett Mm. was someone who was like I don't like adaptations (laughs) they don't work (laughs) they don't happen i'm sorry like i have no faith in it at all but um, he had passed away due to like Alzheimer's. And so mm. Neil Gaiman felt like he was kind of like, almost like a last wish for Terry Pratchett to see Good yeah. Omens become this series. And thankfully it did, you know, through Amazon yeah. Prime. I yeah. think they did, did they do, they did an audio series first, didn't they? They did like a, like a radio play thing Yeah. on the BBC, I think. I'm trying to, because it was like two other famous people who did Crowley and Aziraphale. Mm-hmm can't remember who it was i i, I want to say that it was like uh, two people who've also been in doctor who which is just british actors like they're <laughs> probably gonna have been in doctor who at some point <laughs> but i think yeah. i think it was i think it was two like fairly well-known guys doing doctor doing that good omens i think that was like 
That was what I, th- I want to say that was like late 2000s, early 2010s. Mm-hmm. That they did one for the BBC. Yeah, I had heard that there was a radio show for it as well. And I think when the show was like first announced, I had seen like casting news about it on Tumblr. I'm going to be referencing yeah. Tumblr a lot in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very Tumblr adjacent show. <laughs> it's, you know, it is a very Tumblr adjacent show, which is why I <laughs> wanted to talk about it because I think that this is a little on topic, but still on topic. I feel like a lot of shows that Tumblr latches onto, especially like, I guess in like 2010, 2012 to like 2017, queer baiting was like a really big word because yeah that's what's what was happening like supernatural doctor who sherlock teen wolf that's mm. another one merlin that's another one like <laughs> there are a lot of these shows that like have like these homoerotic subtext with the male characters who are just friends and yeah actually interested in each other anyways and then you yeah. have like this revival of like queer content with like good omens um our flag means death like so many yeah. other shows that like what we do in the shadows is another one like yeah. these shows that are like these characters are queer and they like guys and they could date each other that is a very real possibility i'm telling you right now viewers like it could happen <laughs> you're not just seeing things i swear to god <laughs> you know so it's refreshing to have like good omens which is a show with like two guys michael sheen playing aziraphale david Tennant playing crowley as like an old married couple where like yes yeah they've been like in a relationship with one another it's romantic is it platonic who really cares they love each other they know that you know yeah it's interesting that i think it wasn't michael sheen going to play crowley originally yeah i think when they did it so i think it's interesting how (laughs) how they sort of switched that he said that he um related more to zero fail in like an interview and i think that based off his past castings like the past characters he's played, it makes more sense that he would play Crowley. Yeah, so I'm thinking of Twilight again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know why Twilight is the only movie I could think of. He's been in so many other films, but like... I know, uh, what was it? He, was, he plays Tony Blair a lot. I know he's played Tony Blair like four times. He did it in that one where the queen, where Helen Mirren was the queen. Right. Um, what else? Did he be? I know he's done lots of other like... Oh, um, Frost Nixon as well. I think it'd be the other big one. Yeah. He's played the villain a lot of times in like his past career and David yeah. Tennant has for the most part played relatively good guys. I yeah, there's there's Kilgrave and Jessica Jones is the one I'm thinking of. I think that was his previous like big villain role. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, it's mostly like it's definitely mostly sort of more kind of hero stuff. star. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. The only other role I could think of for David Tennant is Alex Wheelie in Broadchurch. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's the one, there's when he played Casanova in that. So that was like right before Doctor Who, he played Casanova in like the Russell T. Davis one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but it's fun to have good omens as like this kind of like show that people can watch and enjoy. And if you say like, oh, the two leads, leads are queer, no one's going to look at you like, like you're like stupid. Like it's like, oh yeah, yeah. they most likely are. That's perfectly yeah. canon. <laughs> No, exactly. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if we're get, getting slightly ahead of ourselves, but like the shift from almost season one almost being like sort of almost being queer bait, and then season two like almost being like definitively not. It's almost like because the first series was 2019, wasn't it? And then the mm-hmm. second series is like in the 2020. So it's almost kind of representing a shift in the way that that's presented from being sort of like their skirt, a lot of those sorts of like Tumblr adjacent shows kind of skirting around being queer and queerness and into. The sort of early 2020s being more like but outwardly definitively queer with stuff like like you said our flag means death what we do in the shadow shows all that yeah and i think with season one i love this i love season one so much just because like it is a straight adaptation from the book so it's easy to kind of yeah. like follow along with it and i think that one thing i enjoyed the most is just like the story to be able to see like just crowley and azira fail and how like they're kind of separated from their own homes like i guess yeah. their own from like heaven to hell they're not really like huge representative rep- representatives of them um yeah they've gotten so comfortable living on earth and they realize like they've made this huge oopsie because <laughs> the kid that they were supposed to be watching is not actually the antichrist the kid's just like kind of mean but the actual <laughs> antichrist is just like some normal kid that lives yeah. somewhere in london is like oh yeah this kid is the antichrist 
Like, yeah, we've, we've been watching the wrong kid the whole time. Yeah, well, so it's interesting how they immediately go in on the nature of sort of no one's like inherently evil. Mm -hmm. It's like this sort of this assumption that the old oh, the Antichrist would just be born evil, but actually because of this sort of he's been raised by like a nice kind of well-adjusted family, he's actually chill, and it's tying into sort of Crowley kind of believing, oh well, he's a demon, so he's inherently evil, and actually he can be good if he just gives it a try. Mm -hmm. I yeah, think... like no one's kind of like born that way. Oh yeah. The theme of like good and evil and morality is something that is overarching within Good Omens. And I think in like Neil Gaiman's works, where it's not something that you can definitively say is black and white because the world does not work that way. So yeah. to adhere to these kind of like doctrines of like good and evil is ridiculous because yeah. <laughs> it's not a possible thing for people to do, you know? Yeah. And that as, and so that heaven and hell, as the series goes on, especially they reveal themselves not always be like good and evil, but just kind of different kinds of authority. Like they're mm. both kind of as messed up and corrupt as each other, really. But they just have sort of different ideas. It's like hell kind of knows they're evil while they're doing this sort of evil stuff. But heaven also does evil stuff, but they believe they're doing it for the right reasons. Right. Really, that's kind of the main difference between them is just sort of how they perceive themselves. Yeah. I think um, one interesting thing that I noticed while watching the show is it seems like heaven and hell exist in the same building. Like hell is like yeah. in the basement and then heaven yeah. is like at the top of the skyscraper. So yeah, exactly. they're like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, because when they're done, I'm trying to remember from season two, don't they like take the lift down mm -hmm. to hell? Yeah, so yeah. it's like, yeah, exactly. Two sides of the same coin. Right. Literally two floors of the same building. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's funny because like Crowley and Aziraphale are trying to stop the apocalypse because they <laughs> believe like that's what they're supposed to do. And yeah. I'm watching the show and like, I've never missed Sunday school before, you know? So I'm watching the show and I'm seeing Crowley and Zerofeld drive around trying to stop the apocalypse. In my head, I'm like, but wouldn't they want that? Like, wouldn't heaven <laughs> want to win the war to show like they're the good guys and like they won? Yeah. Like, and so when he figures that out, like Aziraphale's so shocked and I'm like, my buddy, I don't know why you're surprised. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess what happens when you're basically like in a cult for like <laughs> thousands of years. <laughs> It's like what you want to destroy the world but it's so nice <laughs> here it's like they don't <laughs> care babe <laughs> Derek jacoby why <laughs> yes <laughs> i genuinely love that about like zero fail is that he's kind of naive almost like he is so yeah. like good and like so kind but it's clear that like living on earth has kind of made him like so comfortable and complacent that he forgets to like you're supposed to be doing work here. Like you're supposed to be working. Yeah. You can't just be jet setting all over the earth. And then there's Crowley who is also not really doing what he's supposed to be doing on earth. Yeah. It's just kind of like, I mean, just chilling like for the most part. Yeah. So that, and they sort of meet in the middle. Cause yeah, cause the is meant to be like doing all the sort of miracle stuff. And he kind of has fallen off doing that. And then Crowley's meant to be doing all the evil stuff. And they've fallen off doing that. And so they sort of kind of come and meet in the middle of just doing, just hanging out basically yeah. for like hundreds of years yeah this will kind of like jump ahead but i think season in season one i didn't really understand like crowley and aziraphale's dynamic in that sense and how like they both seem like kind of complacent to me i'm just like yeah i get that crowley doesn't really want to like do bad things he feels like he kind of has to because he's a demon and he looks at yeah. Aziraphale as the angel and the angel keeps trying to tell crowley like oh find the goodness in you like just look for the goodness and things and stuff like that but in my yeah. head, I'm like, they're so different in a way. I don't understand it. And then season two, Crowley has this, there's this one episode where Crowley keeps saying like, it's too late, you know, like he has yeah. this thing that he's saying. And it seems clear to me that like Crowley believes that the world is just so screwed over and just like, he kind of like yeah. surrenders himself to the nihilism of the world that he feels like there is no other effort that I can put in that will change the end result. This is just the way that things are. And Aziraphale, in comparison, is someone who is, like, so kind, so compassionate, and so just attuned to being a good person that he cannot help but look at things in, like, this white area. It says, like, black and mm. white. He looks in, like, the white area, and, like, he does not see the nuance within the world. And Crowley gives in to the nuance and feels like, there's nothing else I can do. There's no other effort that I could put in that will change yeah. whatever it's going to be. It'll always be too late. It'll always be, like the end of it you know yeah i think that's interesting because obviously 
Crowley has like been an angel, but like Aziraphale's never been a demon, so he's kind of already bailed out of heaven from that sort of very like, thinking already to be like, well, there's nothing I can do here, so I guess I'll just go be a demon kind of thing. And it's sort of that thinking that still carries him through, whereas Aziraphale is very much like there's a right and a wrong way to do things. Yeah, it's interesting because like Crowley, um, in the show, they say that he like created gravity, so he's like some yeah. kind of like heaven's engineer, and yeah any engineer or like comp side major i've met they ask a lot of questions you know they just want to know things yeah. that's like yeah, exactly. that's, that's the basis of science you ask questions you know what i mean so yeah with crowley i remember it was a scene i don't know if this is a season one or season two but it was a scene with him and is your fail and they're both angels at the time and crowley basically says like oh we'll ask a few questions what can that do you know what harm could that bring oh it's the, that's the very first scene of season two right where they're mm -hmm. like making the nebulas and all that stuff yeah yeah that's not the opening of season two yeah yeah and i think that's really like what made him fall but then also like what made him kind of like lose faith because he's like looking around in yeah. hell and it's like i'm not supposed to be here you know like, <laughs> i get that you guys think i'm a devil but like yeah. i did one bad thing that wasn't even a bad thing so now i'm stuck here and he has a yeah. friend who's an angel who cannot see that there's something wrong with the way heaven works <laughs> No, yeah. exactly. It's also like so. Uh, the fact that he's like the one who invented gravity, and then he fell out of heaven. Like, mm -hmm. I think that makes his sense. own knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because like him being an engineer, and then his fascination with like Bentleys and like the way that things work on Earth. I love how that like translates to his character in like you know the human sense. Because like Aziraphale yeah. has like his own um, faults, I guess, where he's been in heaven for so long, he's been like removed from certain things like worldly things so when he's in like on earth he sees what humans like which is like food and like fine dining and like art and he's like really interested in these yeah. things because that's not there in heaven and crowley is that he takes the interest that he has in heaven like engineering and stuff and he finds that interest in like cars and you know like yeah. other things that he tinkers with yeah it's i mean as has become like kind of gluttonous yeah. almost when he's been on it there's obviously like you know big sin and then when he gets down then he realizes that actually like you know having like some pleasures in life is not like inherently a bad thing again it's that idea of sort of you know gabe and terry bradshaw thinking about the stuff that's been inherently said to be this is a bad thing this is a good thing it's like actually having like a nice cake every so once in a while is not like a mortal <laughs> sin like, right yeah I think like enjoying I, yourself yeah enjoying yourself and that's what i like about season one when we figure out like how Crowley does like he has like little crimes here and there. Aziraphale like lets him go like go do his thing, and then like yeah. Crowley and Aziraphale does like good things here, and then Crowley's like not intervening, and they have like this kind of back and forth with each other, yeah. where they just kind of like they have like the symbiotic relationship. Where at some yeah. point <laughs> that kind of comes to a head with the apocalypse, and with them having to find like Adam, and like yeah stopping it. Yeah. yeah, I was interested. One of the sort of like in the closing episode, I remember where they both kind of like beam Adam to that place where they're like talking to him, and you've literally got the shot of them like both like the angel and the devil on one side. And I think it's that it's it's about kind of rejecting the binary of just an angel or a devil, and in Adam kind of embodying like good and evil, like mixing together, kind of. Mm -hmm. I do like you know what I'm getting at like that it's yeah. sort of that kind of like you said the symbiosis yes. kind of represented in this kid right yeah. right 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 and I find it I really did like the ending because of course when the show came out a lot of uh, people online especially Christians were like oh this show is like blasphemous because if you make any <laughs> show based on Christian theology yeah this is always <laughs> And it's funny because they had like an open letter where they got like I think over a hundred thousand signatures, but yeah, they addressed it to Netflix. Yeah, they addressed it to Netflix, and also at the time Amazon had no plans to do a season two, so they were like cancel Good Omens. Mm -hmm. And there was like, well, they're not gonna, and everyone was like, well, they're not gonna do a season two anyway. Which of course, yeah. then they later did, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was... I found it like I found that funny, just like in circumstance of that, but like. To watch the ending and see like the Armageddon be like circumvented was like, oh, this is like an interesting ending because in any other show, I feel like it would have ended badly, I guess. I don't know. Like I was fully expecting yeah. like 
people to die but then i'm like but then there are kids here like they can't kill kids you know what i mean like true yeah yeah i was just i think because like the quit it would have been like a really a hard shift just like kill everyone <laughs> <laughs> so, i would have respected it on like a certain level but... yeah like you're expecting yeah. something bad to happen but then it's like mm. and then he's like no actually let's have like let's have a little fun here you know let's have a goofy little time you know what i mean which yeah. i actually liked <laughs> It's the, the four horsemen taken out in about yes. 30 seconds by a bunch of kids. <laughs> a bunch of kids on their bikes, like, take down, yeah. like, heavenly deities that have been, like, proved, like <laughs> destined before time began to come here and, like, destroy the world. And they're like, I don't think so. Like, <laughs> Good for them. Yeah, that's cute. I think that's cute. Yeah, I think one of the four, well, didn't they change one from the book? Yeah. You're talking about, yeah, I can't remember who got changed. I, I can't either, mm -hmm. but I did want to say um, one of the four horsemen is death, right? Yeah. An interesting criticism that I saw online was that people were talking about death and how in the books Terry Pratchett wrote death as someone who was like I don't want to say funny but someone who was like more endearing you know, like someone who's like I guess charming is the right word to say. Yeah. Yeah. Someone who's like kind of you know an interesting character an interesting dynamic but then when you watch death in the show he's voiced by brian cox who is a great actor who is a great actor um if you don't know who brian cox is he was in secession guys um but like brian cox death is very much like a stereotypical death that you would see in other shows where he's like stoic and he's kind of like scary and scraggly voice versus like the death in terry pratchett's books because people like terry pratchett's death so much they signed a petition for death to reinstate Terry Pratchett as like a joke, you know, because they had grown like so they were so like connected to that um connected to like Terry Pratchett's version of death, I could you could say. And Terry Pratchett also said when he was alive that like terminally ill fans would write him and say that like, Oh, well, I'm not scared of dying anymore because I've read your books and I feel like the death that you write is someone who's so kind and endearing um so i remember just like watching the series and being like oh this death is not the same death that terry pratchett wrote about like that's very oh. interesting yeah yeah just not as nice and i think that is an interesting criticism because i felt that same way about god because he's uh god is voiced by francis mcdormand who I oh love. yeah like academy award-winning uh, actress yeah of course I, she feels kind of like um she feels like a teacher almost like she feels like an assistant director when she's kind of like you know asking as fail like hey where's the flaming sword that i gave you where did that go <laughs> like That's true. she knows where it went because she's god but she's still yeah. asking him and it doesn't feel like a omnipresence presence it almost feels like she's like you know, just kind of asking, like, hey, Zerophil, just checking in. Yeah. Just wanted to know, like, <laughs> that very powerful weapon of divine power and smite. Um, yeah. Do you still have it? Because I have to put it back into, like, the closet. You know what I mean? I have to, like, <laughs> you know, itemize it, put it back in inventory. We got to keep track of all the things that we have. Um, heavily items especially. So yeah. do you have it? Yeah. Or, like, where to go? <laughs> you know? So for me, for me, it came across as, like, kind of backhanded a little bit. It's like... <laughs> It's like, oh, I know you have it. I know you have it, but I'm just giving you the opportunity to like come forward, or I'll just like yeah. smite you. Like you know that I know. It's also interesting because like God doesn't get involved that much in the show, which yeah, it's not. It's Metatron mostly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Metatron is almost like the Wizard of Oz. Sometimes. Yeah, he's the big head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, but we see him like in physical form in like season two, but for yeah. the most part, season one, you don't really like. It's just a big hologram. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. Um, but did you have any thoughts about season one? I guess any final thoughts about season one before we dive into season two? Uh, just that it was very interesting setup. I'll be I'd like some, I think some stuff worked better for me than others. I'll be honest, yeah. like the whole, the whole thing with like, um, Oh, who is it like um anathema device and like i know the, i know the man who's with us played by uh, jack whitehall um 
but I like that whole thing. I'll be honest, it's so obvious that Azura Fel and Crowley are like scene stealers, like immediately, even though they're not kind of like technically the main characters. I guess it's meant to be Adam. Mm -hmm. It's like my interest drops just like a smidge, just like a little bit when it's not on Azura Fel and Crowley yeah. a lot of the time. I think it's really obvious like why they push them so far to the forefront in season two. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed, I think one thing I really enjoyed was Agnes Nutter and like learning about her story and then her descendant, um, then having to like, you know, figure out, find the Antichrist to save the world. And of course, like, yeah. first descendant, like you said, is Jack Whitehall, who is this guy who can't do anything right, which I feel like Jack <laughs> Whitehall is like perfect to play that character because That's he it. just, yeah. he just looks like a guy who tries too hard, you know? <laughs> That's his character in like, absolutely everything. Jack Whitehall plays Jack Whitehall in everything he's in. <laughs> yeah. Um, Even in like, what was that movie? The Jungle Cruise movie. Oh my when he was God, in that. Yeah. He was also playing Jack Whitehall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. I, I'm i not going to lie. I feel like the fav my favorite Jack Whitehall thing I've ever seen was Jack Jack's Travels with his father. Which is, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Netflix show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I think the only reason why I liked it so much is because his dad's kind of mean. And I was like, you know yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> his dad's like really mean. He used to be like an entertainment agent or something as well. Yeah. Which I feel like makes sense with how he talks to his dad. Is talks to his son. Like, yeah. I could see you like talking to some young 16-year-old idol like that. Like, that makes sense. Yeah. It fits. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, I think the one another thing I really liked was Adam. I feel like... I don't know why, but I saw people saying that like the kid who played Adam wasn't good, which I feel like it's kind of hard to say because the kid who plays Adam is a kid. You know what I mean? That's, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll admit that like some of the kid stuff like lost my out of all the storylines. I didn't think any of the storylines were even like close to being bad or anything like that. I thought they were mm -hmm. all solid. But out of the sort of ranking of my interest, definitely whenever it was just like Adam and his friends, that was that was like kind of would be at the bottom mm -hmm. of my whenever like another character wasn't there yeah only only because i think the other adult stuff was more kind of openly weird i guess it's almost, even though adam's like the antichrist i think the stuff that goes on with him is the least like strange part of mm -hmm. good as opposed to you you know like you have the angel and the demon running around and all this sort of stuff i think that the bigger personalities were in the other storylines if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah no it does make sense um but me personally, I like the kid Adam. I feel like he was a pretty strong, you know, part of the story. And I do agree with you because Michael Sheen and David Tennant are scene stealers. Like, in, yeah, every, no, episode, absolutely. <laughs> in every episode, when they're together, you cannot help but like just be pulled by their dynamic, which I feel like is yeah. very, is a good thing to have in that kind of series, especially because yeah. Neil Gaiman is such a great writer to have such strong actors being <laughs> able to like bring your characters to life and bring your words into fruition. is something yeah. that like a lot of creators don't get the pleasure to have. Especially if you're watch especially if you're making something like Good Omens, which is mm. something that could be handled not that well if you have someone at the helm who doesn't know what they're doing. And because like yeah. the game is like so adept into the world of Good Omens since it is like a book he co wrote, it's such a phenomenal series. You know? Yeah. I think Yeah, as I said, just the chemistry really carries it. I mean, I think it's, it's it, like you say, it would have been so easy to get wrong if they cast like two actors who weren't kind of fully going for it. And mm -hmm. I think fully we got two that really do care. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, I did think that oh, Good Omens was going to be just a limited series because that's kind yeah, of. Like, that's how they advertised it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah. I'm not disappointed by season two. I'm genuinely happy about it. I'm not going to lie because I did rewatch season one before season two came out and in my head I was just like how are they going to continue this story because yeah. season one is basically the book brought to life so season two is more of like an abridged version yeah. of the story it did. yeah because I've heard that like season I think Neil Gaiman said himself that like season two is like the bridge between season one the actual book and like the hypothetical sequel that he and Terry Pratchett were sort of half working on when he died like they, was, mm -hmm. they were sort of kicking ideas around for it so it's kind of like I guess Good Omens 1.5 is right. I think how like Neil Gaiman's kind of talked about it a bit. Yeah. And he also talked about how like 
you know, like I mentioned before, he wanted to make this series because Terry Pratchett wanted this book to come to life. But I felt yeah. like after watching season one, after learning that news, like there's not any way there's going to be a season two because I can't imagine what it's like to adapt. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was like... Yeah, like this is your dear friend who passed away. This is a book you wrote together. And now like you've brought it to fruition. That's all you really needed to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think that with him making season two, I'm glad that he continued it because he is like the creator of this world so he's the best person to have like at the helm of the series yeah you know? it's clear that i think they didn't just do it as a cash grab mm -hmm. i think there's like obviously still a lot of heart behind it like there's yeah. he clearly has like something he wants to tell and i think it's like he said he wants to also get kind of the unpublished good omens too mm -hmm. kind of adapted of like in a way so yeah. i think well there needs to be like a bridge between them apparently i guess we'll see how true that is when season three drops yeah that's true um i'm also glad it wasn't a cash grab because i feel like anytime you turn a limited series into like an actual series you yeah take away from the story yeah it's know? it's so obvious when like it was a complete story in the first year and then they just try and keep it going like it's kind of corrected itself now but i think that's kind of what happened with stranger things i know that was meant or that was meant to be like an anthology series where it was like different people each time but then the really? first one was so yeah apparently in the original pitch it was meant to be like different like i think maybe taking place in the same town but like different time periods and things like that and then series one was so successful that they just decided to do it again with the same cast and it kind of shows in that second series which i think is probably the weakest of the show yeah i think one limited series that i didn't enjoy as much when it became like a full series was big little lies i've heard that i haven't seen it it's a pretty good show <laughs> but i do have to say like it's very much like I don't know how to describe this. It's very like white woman TV, like <laughs> from looking at the cast. I like, yeah. yeah, it's giving like Chardonnay glass. You know, yeah. it's giving like a walk through TJ Maxx. You know, it's... Yeah. it's looks like to me it looks like Sex in the City if they started like murdering each other or something. Like. Yeah, yeah, it's like Sex in the City without like it being so fun and like lighthearted. You know, yeah. yeah. It's One good thing show. I see that is. There's no, that one ahead. clip like Mel, Mel that one clip of Mel Streep screaming is the only thing I know from it. Oh my god. <laughs> that was to watch that like live, like in an episode was such a jump scare because the scene is so quiet and they're all sitting around the table yeah. and it's so awkward. And she just screams. It's like <laughs> What the streaks like What the fuck is that? Like it's an Academy Award winner Meryl Streep, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching that scene and I was like, wow, that Emmy's in the bag, isn't it? <laughs> Y'all might as well ship it to her house. Don't even bother with the ceremony. It's hers. It's just like every other award. They might as well just give it to her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Big Little Lies was a really good show because it was based off of like a Gillian Flynn book. And Gillian Flynn also wrote the book Gone Girl. Yeah. So she is very adept in like the white woman troubled world. Of like literary <laughs> fiction you know i know someone needs to check in on her she's written, <laughs> <laughs> she's written those two things like is she doing okay she also has another book called sharp objects which was a mini series oh yeah that was HBO. the amy adams one yeah mm -hmm. which is also another book within the troubled white woman universe you know yeah <laughs> yes um but good like wait wait big look what big little lies is really good because it had a really strong cast a really strong story but as they continued the season it was like do we have to? Oh. Like, I enjoy yeah. it. I like it. But like... Is it necessary? <laughs> yeah. We don't have to continue if y'all don't uh, want to. It seems like... How many every... seasons is it now? I think it had two, three seasons. Maybe. Right. Honestly, if you watch season one, that's enough. Like, oh. <laughs> season one was more than enough. Because so much happened in like that one season where it's like, okay, thank God we're done. And they're like, Season two, it's just been announced. I'm like, why? <laughs> why did that happen? There's enough. There's enough lies. Like, wrap it up, please. <laughs> I think season. I don't know if it's two or three, but it ends with like all the women. It's season one. They do something very terrible, like yeah. something terrible, but something that had to be done. And I think the last season that just had came out, but it was like years ago. It came out. 
they're basically yeah. paying for the consequences of what happened. So I'm sitting here like, okay, so now this is the end. And there are still articles that I get in my inbox sometimes because I had a Google alert for it. It's like <laughs> season four, season three might be announced. Nicole Kidman, Reese Witherspoon talking about the possibility. And I'm like, please shut up. <laughs> Let it die. <laughs> Like, put it to rest. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Please. Not every show. Like, <laughs> that's what I, they better end it with season three. Because I swear, <laughs> I, <laughs> they, they better end good on Because I do, surely there can't like, be more. And at some point, we got to let the actors rest. I don't yeah. want to be see. I don't want to be seeing like season 11, <laughs> Crowley and Azura fail. Like, but that's the thing when you have like such a strong show great cast and like fans that generally love what you're bringing to the table streamers yeah. like networks they want more like they yeah. want more attention they want more eyes on their platform and if the actors say yes which like the actors might say yes because like they want to work and like Neil yeah. Gaiman may not want to do season four but like I mean you never really know like what Amazon yeah. will say because Amazon is always looking to you know up their library of content and yeah they're focusing a lot on like male focus, like male audience content. And Good Omens yeah. isn't exactly that, but they may be wanting to like draw in the fandom space just so they can yeah. have that, you know, appeal. Yeah, definitely. I also I don't blame a showrunner at all for like wanting to keep people employed. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically like, I know like The Simpsons basically has, they just admitted that they just keep going because it keeps half the animators in LA in a, mm -hmm. in a job. Yeah. And at that point, I'm like, you know what? That's fine. I don't care if it's crap anymore. Like, if it gives people a paycheck, it's whatever. I, yeah. Like, like it, it, the world is not, like, worse because The Simpsons is on, like, the season 36. Like, who cares? That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that Good Omens ending after season three would be, like, a smart choice. Um, mm. I was surprised that a season three is, like, a possibility. But I'm not, you know, I'm not deterred by it, I guess. I just say yeah i think one of the things they they got rid of douglas mckinnon for it apparently he's like he was the guy who directed series one and two mm -hmm. i know that's what's been causing some controversy so i know that might be like hopefully there's not a quality dip because of that because i know he was a creative force for it yeah but um in terms of season two what were your thoughts of that series i thought it was it's interesting because i i do like i i felt that there was less Focus. I definitely the plot was like kind of smaller, you yeah. like that, and that you know they're not trying to deal with Armageddon and all that, right? Because they're focusing on like Crowley and Azira Fail together. So the I think season two is more focused on like developing their characters and developing like who they are, getting to know them since they've been friends for over six thousand years. And I think yeah. it's interesting to bring in Gabriel, who was this you know forced to be reckoned with in season one as he was like threatening yeah. zero fail and like his life on <laughs> earth and for him to now be like out of a job and completely like um, out of an identity really because he doesn't know yeah. who he is <laughs> and then yeah, exactly. for them to like try and help this angel who previously in the previous season was hell bent on like destroying the world and them too if they got in there yeah room. yeah i think John Ham's so good. And I think it, like John Ham, they really need to let him do more comedies. Yeah, I see. He's he was. I think he was so good in it. It's also so because it was like the second TV show of the year where he got his ass out. Also in like season five of Fargo, <laughs> he had an ass <laughs> I don't think there's like something in his contracts or something. Yeah. But yeah, yes. he's really been getting naked on screen lately for some reason. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he. I'm. It's, I don't want to speak on John Ham and how he feels, but I like it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not mad about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think he plays Gabriel so well. That's another thing that mm -hmm. I love, like with Tom Hardy playing Venom and like seeing John Hamm playing like Gabriel, who like most people know John Hamm as like Don Draper and like Mad Men. Yeah. So now for him to play like this goofy angel who like doesn't know he's an angel, just thinks he's a person yeah. and is completely lost in his way, and like Crowley and Aziraphale have to figure out like some kind of way to like get him back into heaven and like remedy the situation and figure out what's going on or else like they're screwed again yeah you know exactly i think it's more that's the thing. it's more kind of interpersonal story it's not like it, there is the sort of heaven and hell element but it feels more kind of like 
their bickering. Well, I think the sort of mystique of Heaven and Hell has been kind of removed mm -hmm. across season one. And now you see that they are both sort of barely functioning bureaucracies, like the kind of mythological elements have been taken out of it. And so now they're still like the antagonist, but it's more of like a vibe of almost like the government <laughs> kind of being mad with you rather than like heaven and hell. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's something that was interesting in season one was um, Crowley and Aziraphale basically like outrunning heaven and hell, like you said, like these huge dominating forces that are seen of like biblical proportions. And then yeah. now we're in season two and it's like you said, like they're like governments. It's almost like your job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you want to take off some like some days off from work and they're like, okay, but we need you here. We're short staffed. And like, you know, like yeah. Brian doesn't really know how to work the printer like you do. So like, <laughs> can you like come back early? Like, it's Is kind that, of like that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, when the angels like they show up for, like to inspect his bookshop and it's not <laughs> like in season one, that was like a big, like massive thing. And now in season two, it's, they're just kind of like annoying. It's like trying to hide something from your mm -hmm. boss. Yeah. Rather than like, you know, the antichrist level stuff. I also love the scene in the bookshop where the angels come in and Gabriel's like right there. And it's yeah. like, who's this guy? <laughs> like, why is there a dude in your bookshop? Like, is your phone's like, oh, this is my assistant, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, why do you have a random human in here? Gabriel, we need to talk to you. Like, we need to find Gabriel. Where is Gabriel? <laughs> It reminded me of the scene where Crowley tells Jim to kill himself and he almost does just like <laughs> jump out the window. <laughs> Is that the last it's been like, wait, 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 no, no. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, that was so funny, honestly. But <laughs> I think I also love the little like side story of like the two I guess shopkeepers. Well, there's a lady who owns yeah. the shop and there's a cafe <laughs> owner. Um Yeah. They're both um the two of the nuns from season one, aren't they? Yeah. The same, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is fun to see, like, them trying to do, like, hijinks to be like, okay, well, we're going to try and, like, make them fall in love because <laughs> Crowley and Aziraphale did the miracle to, yeah. you know, kind of cover Gabriel. So when Heaven came down, they wouldn't notice. And Heaven did came down and it, like, worked. And so Aziraphale was like, oh, that was to, like, make these two humans fall in love. Yeah, because of course. We, we just love love. Yeah. Like. <laughs> it's, the, it's so much more of like a silly plot than season one and i don't mean that like in a bad way at all <laughs> but it's much more like it's like you said it's like goofy hijinks i think yeah. a lot more i think i enjoyed that so much because when you go from like season one of like high stakes and like there's so much writing on this to season two and you're just kind of like yeah. oh well this isn't like that stressful because like you're just yeah. meant to like kind of ground the I think it's meant to like ground the story and also like take the time for us to like really get to know these characters because in season one yeah. you don't really do that you just kind of like assume Crowley's this way as your feels that way but yeah. you don't spend any time with them except like a few flashbacks and like who they used to be in the past yeah and, and now this one there's like that whole episode which is like yes. devoted to their like kind of journey yes exactly and there's one actress who's in season two who plays the nun and also plays the coffee um, clerk, not the coffee clerk, but the coffee owner. And I've seen oh, yeah. her in like- Oh, um, Nina Sasanya is yes. her name. She shows up in a lot. She was, once again, she was in Doctor Who. <laughs> she, <laughs> she was, do you remember the, the David Tennant episode with the girl who can like draw stuff? And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. She's, the, she's her mum. Yeah. In that, I know yeah. that. And she's, like one, she's one of those British actors who shows up in like quite a lot of stuff. I always see her in something with David Tennant. Like Yeah, wasn't she was in Love Actually as well, I think. <laughs> yes, Love Actually. And she was also in like Staged, which is their Oh yeah, yeah, their like lockdown. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> the lockdown series that they did that also became like a real TV show later on. Yeah. Yeah, they did like three or four seasons of that. Yes. That came from Good Omens, I think, as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it did. Which Honestly, I like David Tennant and Michael Sheen's chemistry just like on and off screen. I feel like mm. they connect really well as actors. And I don't know. I try and think of like other actors that connect that well. But like, I can only think of like fandom examples. <laughs> like yeah. um, Colin Morgan and Bradley, Bradley James. James. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or... that's, another, that's another one. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
watching this show did make me think of Merlin just like a little bit because I did enjoy that show a lot and it was like you know magical elements but it was I think I don't know if I'm gonna say underrated but not as I guess popular as other shows yeah but... no go ahead I've no I just said I only saw like season one of Merlin I think when it first aired Mm-hmm. I remember that back in like 2008 I remember because it was like the kind of off-season replacement for Doctor Who is how it started I mean you can tell it's definitely there's definitely like a vibe shared between them but yeah but I do have lots of friends who are into Merlin I saw all the stuff it's like, it's like I've never seen a sing- single episode of Supernatural but mm-hmm. I know like most of the plot just from having been on Tumblr when it was really popular mm-hmm. yeah it's funny because like me as I got I've gotten older I feel like I left like the fan of stuff behind because I was such a huge fan of Merlin that I rewatched the series like three times over and like <laughs> Supernatural this is very worrying I've rewatched that show like 10 times over like uh, that's a long show as well mm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> mind you I got into the show in middle school so I had nothing else to do you know <laughs> Yeah. All I did was go to school and like do homework, and then I w- came home and I rewatched Supernatural because my cousin gave me his Netflix password, and I was like, "This is the only thing I want to watch." <laughs> did you like stick it out like right to the end to the finale? <laughs> I stopped watching in season ten because they killed off a female character that everyone really liked and I really liked, but then right. they brought in Lucifer's son, and I was like, "Hmm, interesting." I'll give it a shot. And then I gave it a shot and I was like, eh, it's fine. And they announced that the show was ending. And I was like, okay, well, now I have to catch up because you're not going to leave me in the dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd heard, that, I'd, I'd heard that a lot of people really didn't like the finale, but I sort of watched that from afar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. Like, I always knew that the finale of Supernatural was going to be disappointing just because, like, a show can only go on for so long for it to continue to be good and supernatural stopped yeah. actually being good long before yeah. that finale so it's like i yeah i heard it was meant to, that's another like kind of example wasn't it only meant to be like five seasons mm. and then they just keep going because it was so popular and then they, <laughs> they just kind of dragged on like limited series sometimes too yeah also when supernatural was first out there was always the threat of it being canceled because it came out around the same time that Smallville came out. Came out, yeah. And people kept comparing the two shows, and they're like, "This isn't as good as Smallville." But then I think after season four, when they started introducing the apocalypse and like Supernatural, it was like they did like the apocalypse, like the actual like <laughs> biblical apocalypse. Like here's <laughs> the Lotus, here's like the four horsemen, angels, devils, God, like all these biblical characters in the yeah. show. So that's what really drew up a lot of like attention for the show. The season five was actually a very good season. Like season four or five were really solid. So of course after that success, they're like, hmm, let's keep it going, you know? <laughs> yes. Most yeah. profitable show on the CW. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you say that because apparently the CW has not made any money since it became the CW. Really? And that was like 2004, like what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> My God. <laughs> Yeah, apparently they haven't actually, like, made a substantial profit since it became the CW after, like, going from, like, UPN to the WB, and they, like, canceled a huge flagship of, like, shows that they had, mainly shows with, like, black cast, and they were like, hey, let's do Smallville, let's do Vampire Diaries, let's do Supernatural, (laughs) let's do all this stuff, and, yeah. Always the way. (laughs) you think that like the flash and supernatural or something combined would have given them like a few dollars i don't know god i don't know riverdale <laughs> even that was popular for a little bit like something surely not even for a little bit like throughout the entire run people were still watching that show and i don't know yeah. if it was unironically but i i never liked that show if i'm being honest I... No, I didn't. No, I I think I definitely was. It turned into a hate watch about like five episodes in. I think I bet. I think I bailed. Is it the end of season one where like Archie's dad gets shot by like the guy in the hood? I, I think, think that's so. where I stopped watching. I think that's where I stopped watching. I just. I don't think I bothered to pick it up again when it came back for season two. Wow. I think after there was a season where like every other episode was a musical episode, I was just kind of like, Oh yeah. We need to wrap I'm, this up. When some of them like musicals like written by one of the showrunners or something, or am I making that up? I I don't know. I just know they did like a Heather's one and a Rocky Horror one. Yeah. And... Did they leave Blonde, didn't they? I don't or think I... so. No. 
What's the other? It's because it was like the ones that like high schools do because they're like cheap to get the rights for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't remember. I want to say hairspray, but I don't think it was hairspray. It was like that was death. Yeah, I know they did a Heather's one though. They definitely did a Heather. I remember the Heather's one. <laughs> yeah, I think they may have done Grease, but then I might be. Yeah, might, might be, be mixing it up with Glee, which is like fair enough. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But <clears throat> honestly, just brought that up to say, like, most shows that I started watching in, like, a fandom space, they, like, they're good for a while, but then they're bad. So with season two of Good Omens, I was like, this is going to be good. I know it's going to be good because I have faith in Neil Gaiman. And it was great. I love it. But I feel like with season three, um, I think that, I don't want to say it's going to be bad, but there is this weird, like, season three curse that some shows have where, like, the yeah. first season, good, solid foundation. Great background. We're starting up really strong. Season two, continue the story. Awesome. You hit all the points. It's great. Season three. Uh, yeah. It's think, not giving. <laughs> season three is really where, like, it's either going to be, like, incredible and you're like, oh, these guys know what they're doing, or it's going to absolutely torpedo the entire show. Yeah. It really goes either way. Yeah. And I think that with having, like, David... Tenet and Michael Sheen you have two very strong actors to help your show and even with what we saw in like the final season of season two which <laughs> oh my god I was so I don't want to say I was happy but like when yeah. you spend so much time in your life watching shows that queer bait you to death yeah no exactly <laughs> and Absolutely. you finally do you remember have... when they go ahead no, do you, I was just gonna say, do you remember when they leaked it in that trailer for like they put they put out like a trailer for Prime Video or whatever they put out like a trailer for Valentine's Day or something? What it is? And it had the Crowley Zerofell kiss in it. It did. And I took it, yeah, it was like a montage of kisses, and for some reason they put the and this was like before it dropped. The series was released. I think it was for Valentine's Day, and it's people started memeing it because it was like. It was it was one of these things where it, like it was like a shot and then like a word over it and they were doing that and the Crowley and Zero Fair one had like a specific word over it, it as like part of the bigger like, marketing phrase mm -hmm. and I can't and so people started making fun of it by just like typing the word but I can't remember what the word was but I remember that they leaked it in the trailer and everyone was like what the f oh my god I can't believe I missed that yeah I remember it's good they took it down like thirty minutes after they put it up but <laughs> lots of people like screen recorded it yeah yeah. I mean, you would want that to be a surprise. Yeah. Yes. And, and it just ceased to be. Thanks, Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Some One of these social media managers definitely got fired that day because they're like, Yeah. Bro, don't, How do you like... little, don't spoil the little gay show. We need these people to watch it. Like... <laughs> oh my God. We, we have to make them not certain if they're being queer baited or not until that last episode. <laughs> <laughs> we need them to hold on. <laughs> Yes, um, I think in the final season of season two, it's such an interesting shot for me because the camera kind of pans back and forth so often. You're kind of seeing like Crowley because in the beginning he's trying to say something because Aziraphale talks so much in the relationship and Crowley just listens. Yeah, and yet Aziraphale still interrupts him, and it's so tough because you're watching the entire series of season two and even the whole show where it's very clear, like, heaven and hell don't know what they're doing, you know? Even though yeah. Kelly is going to face, like, some kind of judgment, which, like, he is kind of scared and worried for in season two, it's clear that, like, heaven and hell lack any real bureaucracy to control yeah. these rogue agents of their <laughs> domains. Yeah. I, th I think it's the whole thing about, like, as well, when... Because, I mean, I said earlier that Zero Fail was in a cult, like, kind of half joking, but it is, like kind of true because it's this whole thing about like oh that he thinks he can like fix stuff from within the city like, he's like he through kind of crowley's help he sort of rejects the kind of cult of heaven but the second that that kind of comfort comes back in a little bit of a way because in season two there's a little bit of like he's completely cut off from heaven so he can't like there's there's a little bit of comfort lost and then when heaven comes back it's like oh you can actually come back and you can you know it can be just like it was again he immediately jumps on it and it's interesting to see that kind of character regression i guess it would be because i think it would be so easy for him to be like no 
I reject it completely and I'm with Crowley now, but I think it's so much more interesting for him to be not like, I guess just more like complex and not just complete. Like you, you don't get queer basically, but you also don't just get like the happy full on. Yeah. Yeah. I do agree with you on that because Aziraphale, like he does reject it at some point with Metatron, but it's so clear that like Metatron is manipulating him, you know, Mm. like he just lost his Supreme Angel which he kicked out, by the way, because he didn't <laughs> yeah. want to do another apocalypse. He was like, yeah, hey guys, exactly. we already tried this. It's tired. Like, maybe we should try something different. We should think of something else. You know what I mean? Yeah, let's get Jesus back. Let's yeah. <laughs> you know what, guys? Let's get another Messiah. Okay, three years on our side. What do you think? We could use it. <laughs> and then he was like, no, nah, bro. And he kicks him out. And then turns out Gabriel is in love with the demon. He's been in love with him the demon this whole time and they yeah. run off together so now metatron's like well i need a lackey yeah and this idiot somehow keeps helping us in some inadvertent way so let's bring it back i don't know let's let's try it out and it's so clear that he's trying to manipulate is um is there a fail because there's a scene yeah. where like he walks into the bookshop and the angels don't recognize him as like metatron so I guess like maybe it's like his first time being like in a like a human yeah. body. And yeah. when he talks to Aziraphale, he sounds like Aziraphale. Because Aziraphale has these really weird like sayings that he has, like jolly good. Jolly yeah. hell. You know? And he's just like <laughs> copying him. He's like, I'm just like you, you know, I'm a little goofy too. And then he's <laughs> yeah. like, Hey, you know, I have this coffee for you. I also like to ingest things like you. <laughs> I also like to eat food. Very good. Yeah. Like, so I in think a very, it was... like, alien way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, I think the thing is that some fans I saw were saying, like, oh, he's, like, he's drugged the coffee. He's put a spell on a zero fellow. But I think it's, like, it's a much more, like, kind of subtle manipulation. I think it, I don't think there's any sort of, like, magic or whatever. Mm-hmm. And what he's just kind of playing on a zero fellow's insecurities mm-hmm. and, like, what he wants. And, again, it's that sort of you can come back to the fold and you can fix stuff and zero fail still clinging on to that kind of naivete of like well heaven can be fixed the stuff mm-hmm. that's wrong now but like the core concept is fine whereas crowley's like no the whole thing's screwed and we should just reject it completely yeah because zero fail he's fine with disobeying disobeying heaven as long as he has crowley by his side you know yeah he doesn't want to go it completely alone so when metatron gives him the chance to like go back to heaven he says no at first and then he's like well you can ch- choose who you work with and he's like oh so in a sense he's like i could be supreme angel which is something i always wanted and never sold anybody but then i could yeah. also hang out with crowley and not get in <laughs> trouble for it because i'm supreme angel and you can't tell me shit. <laughs> yeah and it's that thing that he doesn't understand that like he, he just sort of projects that crowley also obviously wants to be an angel as well Mm-hmm. And even though there's not really like Crowley has quite clearly said he doesn't want to be an angel, he doesn't want anything to do. But Aziraphale's like, oh yeah, come back because being an angel is like better than what you are now. And he doesn't understand like kind of how it's rude that mm-hmm. is, and like how kind of insulting that is to his friend to say that he's kind of not enough as he is. Sort of the implicate. I don't think he's like intentionally doing it, but it's like he's so deep in. Again, he's so deep in the cult, he doesn't even realize like how. In- uh, upsetting that would be to Crowley right. it's like an offer he just in his mind believes that like like you said there is something that still can be changed and he can be the one yeah. to change it and he wants Crowley alongside with him because they've done all of these things together that he's like mm-hmm. I can't imagine doing this without you you know I need you with me and Crowley who is more than fine with leaving like the heaven and hell bullshit alone yeah. does not want his friend wrapped up and the hierarchies and bureaucracy and the bs that comes with yeah. like, the heavenly domain because it's not going to change anything yeah exactly yeah. it's so interesting i like gabriel's like he's he's way more committed to like heaven in season one and azura feels one is kind of going like oh and he's not sure mm-hmm. but then in season two the second he gets his memories back he's like nope i'm a, out of here with yeah. my new partner i'm gone and <laughs> completely off because i think he's just even the because in that season one, he was very committed to Armageddon and all that stuff. Whereas Aziraphale's like, I think the whole thing is he's not really ever been able to commit to anything kind of under right. his own steam. I think like I say, he needs Crowley with him. Yeah. 
Whereas opposed to Gabriel, like, knew exactly what he wanted, mm -hmm. whether it was, you know, destroying the world or not. Yeah, and it's clear with Gabriel that, like, after the first apocalypse was circumvented and Metatron's big plan was, like, to bring another one, he was just kind of like, well, if the first one didn't why, why would yeah. the second one, why are we doing this yeah. again? Yeah, also, he kind of, I mean, he goes through sort of, he, like, speed runs the same arc that like, Ezra <laughs> and Groly are kind of, where he goes to Earth and he's like, you know, and he experiences, like, desire, basically, and he's like, you know, actually, I kind of want to live in the world. Mm -hmm, right uh, yeah like this place is kind of nice and you know what i actually think that you guys suck so yeah. i'm gonna rock <laughs> I down <quit>. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like y'all got it you don't need me you never listen to me anyways it doesn't matter yeah like, i'm good <laughs> exactly and i think with azir fail becoming like the supreme angel of course it's something that's like possibly a dream for like any angel in that domain because you have like all this power but i feel like mm. he'll soon realize like there's a limit to your power you know <laughs> yeah it's clear that like god within like the good omens universe isn't like this domineering all-powerful omnipresent feature he's like yeah. not as omnipresent but like not interested in being involved yeah it's definitely an absent kind of god it feels like metatron has kind of mm-hmm it, like it's if it, like it's no like i guess god does know what's going on but they don't care or it's like the ineffable plan i guess that's part of it they're like you know nobody knows if god is actually involved in anything or not right and mm. i think it's kind of the thing where it's like oh well since god isn't really involved you don't see like the workings but they're working but at the same time god's like laid back on lazy boy he's like y'all got it um <laughs> it's all cool if you want to do another apocalypse that's great just let me know i, I either way i'm okay you know and metatron yeah. is basically like taking the reins so to speak yeah yes and i wanted to ask because like it doesn't feel like there's a villain in good omens so to speak it doesn't really feel like there's a bad guy i guess like with heaven and hell you could say heaven yeah. is a villain but like not really do you think that metatron yeah. is a villain oh, i th i think he's like he's definitely the kind of greatest guy. i think in season three he might take a more like directly kind of villainous role i think that like because obviously they the kind of last thing he says is like that they're gonna get just time for the second coming or stuff so i think that he's probably gonna be manipulating a zero fail with jesus somehow and like i, th I think there's gonna be at the moment i think he's more like <clears throat> i don't know it's interesting because he's not like like because you've literally got like satan in season one <laughs> shows yeah. up and he's like the classic kind of evil. He's like kind of technically the villain, even though he only shows up at the end. But Metatron's more of kind of like, I th I think he kind of with this sort of manipulation, he's he's sort of crossed over kind of into villain territory. Like at the end of season two, I think season season three is probably gonna end with them like beating him up. Isn't that's my official prediction for season three? Is that he's gonna get jumped by Crowley and Azurafe? Right. I think. Um... Oh, now that you mention it, I forgot that they were looking at casting Jesus in season three, which I think. Oh, be... it... yeah. I think so. Which I, I think th will I be think... interesting. Yeah. Do we know? Are there any front runners for that? I don't know. I know there have been fan castings for. I don't know the actor's name, but have you seen the movie Yesterday? Yeah. Oh yeah, that guy. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, I could see it. Yeah. Mm hmm. Or. I think people are really just really vibing with the brown Jesus for the most part. Yeah. And I think that's probably like what they're going to be going towards either maybe like an yeah. established actor or like an actor that people don't really know. Some people have also suggested Kingsley Benadir, which I'm not against. Oh, yeah. I feel like he would be a good fit. Um, yeah. But I think it would be interesting to see season three because I feel like if you introduce Jesus, Jesus is going to be like the laid back son of God who's like, hey yeah guys what's up it's all peace and love <laughs> and he's just like at concerts sometimes and just like chilling and then like his earphone go up to him like so jesus messiah um metatron wants to do this thing and i'm not like 100 percent for it i was wondering if you could talk to him he's like hey as you're a fail you seem really chill you seem really nice dude like i'm glad that you're yeah. really participating like getting into it look that's more of my dad's domain i'm just hanging yeah. out you know like I'm about to go to Coachella, so if you need me, feel free to hit me up. I will always answer, but that doesn't mean I'm Peace and love. Up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's the, I wonder, because obviously there's going to be like a deconstruction of Jesus. I wonder if they're going to go for that kind of peace and love, or if he's going to be like a kind of dickhead Nepo baby. 
and they're going to go God. more sort of like that kind of i don't know because i could see them doing like either way that either like they have jesus yeah being very laid back or he's actively like almost kind of like a secondary antagonist in that mm. he is just a bit of an asshole in like yeah. degrees i don't think he'll be like evil at wanting to destroy the world or anything like that but just that he's a bit of a prick yeah i can see them going that way as well just like kind of annoying and like as you're focused yeah. to him he's like in his workshop like making a chair and like zero was like hey can you get your help with something he's like listen bro when i'm done, <laughs> when I'm done. he's like what are you gonna be yeah. doing with that chair it's like i've been working on this chair for a century i'll let you know <laughs> i remember I remember when you saw me getting crucified and you two didn't do anything about it. You guys let me hang there for a while, so I'm gonna let you hang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um I think that with season two, it was a really good addition. I'm glad that it was really solid. And I'm happy that like Aziraphale and Crowley have like confirmed that they're not just besties. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like there are fans that are expecting like a lot of fans were expecting more intimate scenes with Aziraphale and Crowley. Like, I guess not like literally like intimate, but like them yeah. holding hands or like them showing some kind of like physical touch. And I think that the vibe that you're going for is that like they are two old men that don't care if they're gay or not, but they've been knowing each other since like the beginning of time. So the fact yeah. that they may be in love with each other is not really like something they have to define. It's just something they kind of like it's unspoken almost no is that is that i mean you've got the kind of sort of different kinds of i mean you've got like the other like immortals the like gabriel and beelzebub like heading off together then you've got the two shopkeepers where it's that's more of kind of like a human like mm -hmm. love like declaration and then you've got a zero phone call where it's like this weird kind of like they've been friends like it's all very like entangled with them because they've watched like all of history together so yeah it's interesting how there's sort of there's there's like the kind of three core relationships of season two I also love how the record keeper, like the record shopkeeper and then like the cof cafe owner yeah. did not care that Crowley is a demon, did not care that this girl <laughs> is an angel. It's like, hey, guys, whatever's going on between the two of you, you need to work it out. You just yeah. need to tell them how you feel. You need to talk it out. Like and when they're leaving, this is your for like, listen, you have a lot to talk about. And that's it. Like, they don't care. Yeah, it's again, it's almost like an extension of season one where it's like, they've got these big sort of lofty heaven and hell ideas and it's when they come down to earth and they're like oh actually we just kind of want to hang out it's sort of the, an extension of that it's mm -hmm. the second they talk to two humans about their relationship that they're just like just talk to each other like it's yeah. not that difficult yeah. but i don't know why it took you five thousand years to work this out or whatever <laughs> you guys keep going off at adventures and the last thing you've done is like talk about each other's feelings like yeah what's harder circumvent an apocalypse or confess your feelings for each other like let's Let's it's like it took it took us two months and it's taken you like centuries like this is embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> and we've known each other maybe even that long but like at least we actually got to the root of it and you guys are still not on the yeah. same page yes um what are your thoughts for season three what do you think is gonna happen season three well i think there's metatron's gonna be like the villain i don't know i don't know if they're gonna bring like anyone back from season one if there's gonna be like and um, because that was the one thing about season two it's interesting how many sort of plots they just kind of jettisoned like straight up like there's no anathema there's no adam mm. right now there's no um what was his name was it shadwell like the like witch hunter guy yeah where it was like the demon hunter so i wonder if like i think they might try and bring some of them back because it's gonna be because they're going back from that personal story to that again that very big like expansive story of like the second coming so i think that's i think the kind of the scale is going to return definitely mm -hmm. um i don't i don't want to speak it into existence that either crowley or Zerafel dies but like i could see i could Ooh. see them maybe i could see them I, I hope that they're smart enough not to bury their gaze immediately <laughs> but, but no, we'll see the third season <laughs> yeah um <laughs> gosh i forgot immediately i thought like how do you kill an angel or a demon but i feel like that's besides the point it's like the holy water isn't it because they tried to oh. and they try to because remember at the end of season one where they like they were going to kill them like, right i do remember that i do remember that yeah um i feel like with season three because like season one i feel like season one of any show could be kind of a gamble they don't really like put a lot into the budget so a lot of mm -hmm. things that you saw in season one were like that 
didn't look that good i guess you could say yeah um, yeah the satan was a the satan thing was like something that comes up like yeah that's good it's like <laughs> oh y'all could have spent a little bit more on this but okay that'll work yeah yeah <laughs> It's also I, like all the other designs are like quite imaginative, and then like mm -hmm. the Satan design is like it's like okay, yeah, it's the most like kind of it's just what anyone thinks of when they think of like the devil, right? And I think for season one they had planned on having like actual heavenly angels, like an army, but like with yeah. the budget, it's like oh that can't work, you know? Yeah, so we just got like a queue of them that's like going back, right? So I think with like season two then being a more grounded story. You could tell like there was a little bit more put into the budget, especially with the episode when Aziraphale has the Pride and Prejudice party in his bookshop. Oh the yeah, yeah. <laughs> the demons of hell are like outside. <laughs> yeah, it's the fact that sort of like the street is like completely fake in a studio, and they just like blue screen the whole thing, which mm -hmm. I genuinely didn't realize until like I watched the behind the scenes thing. I thought they just like actually sectioned off like a part of London. Yeah, but this is like all fake. Oh, that was incredible. Yeah, and I really do love that about the show. Um, I think that with season three, there will definitely be a jump in like production quality, um, mm -hmm. which which tends to happen with shows after like later seasons. Like there seems to be like better like um, wardrobe. There seems to be like um, the set design is different, and like if any graphics are used, they're a lot more cleaner and like better utilized. So I feel like with season three, yeah. they're definitely going to try. I don't know if they're going to try to do the apocalypse again. I feel like. <laughs> It feels movie like, statement. yeah it's like that's a little worn out but then it's like we're going through theology though and that's the only thing they talk about in there so that's true i guess you could make it look a little bit different i guess <laughs> yeah so i think it'll be it's definitely going to be interesting the season three but i'm very excited for it um i feel like i've been so excited for certain shows and they're so disappointed by it that like with season three coming up it's like i want this to be good i want this to be great because like the show for the most part has done a good job of being authentic and a faithful adaptation to the series and like terry pratchett's estate has talked about how like even in season two there are a lot of things that seem very like similar and like close to what terry pratchett would have wanted of a continuation yeah. of the book and it's clear with Neil Gaiman at the helm of it, he knows what he's doing. He's a very capable writer and a very capable director. And when you have a team behind you that has like a faithful leader, you're going to bring in good results. So all that I'm hoping for is that like it has like a good, strong reception from the fans. And I'm just excited for like whatever story they're going to bring, even though there isn't like that much. There aren't that many details that have been talked about in terms of what the story will be, you know? Yeah, no, I think I do, I do have more confidence than I would for like some other shows going into like a season three, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yes. So, I am definitely excited. Um, do you have any last thoughts about Good Omens, the series? Uh, just please don't mess up season three. <laughs> that's, my, <laughs> that's my last thought. I do want to say that I find it incredibly endearing how, like, um, uh, crap, I forgot his name. Michael Sheen and David Tennant are like kind of like best friends from yeah. the show. <laughs> I love seeing their interviews. I love watching stage, and I feel like that really does bring a lot of magic to the show. Yeah, no, definitely. You can tell. Like, I think like I said earlier that season one really does like kind of live and die on the chemistry between Crowley and Aziraphale, and they absolutely went so out for it. You can tell they're just like really, really good actors, like in their own right as well. But then when they come together and bounce off each other, it's it's magical. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. I hope I hope that they do other stuff together after Good Omens ends. Because yeah. I know stage is over, but I hope they do more stuff. Oh, yeah. And I feel like a lot of times when you're watching um, shows, like me, as someone who loves to watch like TVs, TV shows and movies, um, something that I've kind of reckoned with is that like the relationship that actors have between each other is also a part of marketing because they have to do interviews, mm. they have to like do TV spots, they have to do like commercials yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah. and they have to look like they get along. So mm. if the actors get along and the characters in the show also get along or the movie, then you're more inclined to watch it and you're more inclined to like be interested in like their late night spots, their like, you know, morning yeah. show interviews or whatever. And that's meant to drive like more um, eyes to whatever they're trying to promote. And I like that with Michael Sheen and David Tennant, from what I can see, they generally seem to work well with each other and are like yeah. dear friends. 
and I enjoy that. You know, I like that. Um, David Tennant has always been seen like as a wholesome person. You know, like a well beloved like actor. And Michael Sheed, it's not that he's not, but like <laughs> Michael <laughs> Sheed is like an interesting character. You know, with him yeah. like, dating like someone who's like about the same age as his daughter. And like, oh, yeah, I saw that show. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> and, I saw um, that TikTok clip. <laughs> for those who don't know, there is a show or I think a special that Michael Sheen did where he speaks to like a lot of yeah. things, like um, cognitive disorders. And one yeah, was like, asked him, yeah, like, so why are you dating somebody who's old enough to be your daughter? And <laughs> yes. <laughs> There was I mean, like, yeah to to be fair he gave like a very like thoughtful answer he wasn't like offended by it or anything mm -hmm. to be honest <laughs> you have to have like no other like honestly like the autism it jumped out you know you just like yeah. you just asked the question was, uh, what's wrong what's wrong I know. with the question I know. I want to see the producer who went to the BBC and was like, I've, "I've got here's my pitch for a show. We get a bunch of like autistic kids and we get them to ask famous people questions." No restraint, no holding back, no second guessing. Yeah, absolutely. This is made with public money, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Merlin, government funding. Balls <laughs> to the wall. Ask them what you want to know. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um. I'm not gonna lie. I used to be someone who read um, blind items way too much. So like, Michael Sheen is someone I've seen <laughs> pop up every once in a while. But I do enjoy his acting. Yeah. Sorry, my sister just walked in. <laughs> yeah, but I am very excited for season three of Good Omens. I think it's gonna be spectacular, and um, I feel like that kind of wraps up our talk about Good Omens. So yeah. we could kind of just wrap it up by giving like recommendations. Um, guys, this is the final segment where we talk about recommendations, where we just like kind of give you like some shows and like some movies that we've seen recently that we think you should check out. And one show that I actually watched recently, it's on Tubi, um, which is interesting because I feel like Tubi is like a, a, yeah. a streaming platform that a lot of people have written off because- I don't think we have it over here. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's in the UK. <laughs> To be fair, a lot of the things on Tubi are awful. Like <laughs> that's what I've heard about it. That's how it what that's all I know about Tubi is that everything on there is bad. So I've heard. Yeah, it has a lot of like it has a lot of movies on there that are very much like would be straight to DVD, straight to TV, mm. like absolute just like ass, if I'm being honest. Yeah. But there is one show that they have on there called Big Mood, starring uh Nicola Coffin. Coughlin? Oh, that's um, Channel 4 over here. Yeah, yeah. Nicola mm -hmm. Coughlin and is it Lydia West? Yes. Yeah, I've heard of that. It's a ch I think it's made by Channel 4. So we do have it over here. Okay. But I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't gone around to watching it yet. I have just started watching. I think I've just finished episode two. It's a, it's a pretty good show. Um, I feel like it's similar to This Way Up. I don't know if you've seen that with Asling B. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't, again, another one I didn't see. I think it's also <laughs> Channel 4. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I do know, yeah, I do know what you, which one you're talking about. Right. Uh, for those who don't know, I probably, you've probably seen, like, TikTok ads about it because that's how I found out about it. But uh, Big Mood is a show with, like, Nicola Coffin and Lydia West. And it's about these two friends. Um, one owns a bar that is, like, failing. Another is a young woman who has bipolar disorder and has decided to get out, go off her meds. And so the show kind of, like, follows their friendship and follows, like, the adventures that they go on. They're not really adventures. They're adults. Adults will go on adventures. Like, you live <laughs> life. <laughs> like, that's basically yeah. it. Do your taxes as an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing I hate about TV descriptions. It's like, watch these two best friends go on adventures and live the high life. Like, they're struggling. There are no adventures here. Like, <laughs> no one's having Surviving fun. is an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Barely getting by is not an adventure, okay? <laughs> it Watch is... the struggle. <laughs> so, surviving, like, multiple side quests to get to your main quest, that was also hell. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good show. It's very solid. I would recommend anyone watch it. Um, if you like it, if you're not really, like, put off by, like, depictions of mental illness, I would suggest that you check it out. I haven't finished it yet, so if there's something in the show that you are kind of put off by and I recommended it to you, please don't get mad at me because it's not my fault. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> 
Yes. Um, are there any recommendations you have for the audience or like anything you've watched recently? I don't think the thing I've watched most recently that I've enjoyed was the Fallout show. Again, another oh. Prime show. I think <laughs> that, 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 that was really good. I've, I mean, I was a long time fan of the video games anyway. So, and I think video game adaptions have a really long history of not being very good. Yes. So when it was announced and like the trailers come out, I was like, mm. but it's 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 really good it feels like because it's not a direct adaption of any story from the video games it's just like set in the same universe with the same vibe mm -hmm. and i think it's you don't need to play the video games at all to get it it's very like kind of it's 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 very violent <laughs> it's also like very funny there's a lot of kind of commentary on like corporations doing bad stuff and things like that it's i think it, it it's it's got like a wide appeal i a lot of people I know who've never played the video games really like it. I don't want to give like too much away because I think it's best to go into that kind of without knowing too much about like the Fallout lore and the tone and all that stuff. But I think it's really good. It's got really solid performances. It's only eight episodes, but it feels like one of those shows where they actually they know how to use those eight episodes. Nothing feels like crap, rushed mm. or anything like that. And the brush about they threw a lot of money behind this you can tell because there's one there's like because they walk around these big like suits of like powered armor and it's they're like actual full-on props that like open and close and they've got like real weight to them you can tell that it was made by like people like the good omens adaption you can tell it's by people who really had a lot of love for the source material and thought really difficult really hard about how to port it over to tv so i would like really recommend that um if you're into that kind of stuff that's what i've been watching yeah, it's like um, a post-apocalyptic series. Yeah. Yes. There, I'm not going to lie, like, Amazon, like I said before, loves, like, I guess, male-focused, male-centric audience shows. So mm. what, I've been meaning to watch Fallout for, like, ever since it came out, to be honest. And yeah, I am pretty excited to watch it. I also find it, like, funny when Amazon makes shows that are, like, anti-establishment anti-corporations and like yeah i was because it's like there's a big theme in the world of like how evil corporations are it's like mm. presented to you by an evil corporation the same with the boys like the boys hates like bot yeah and like the industry that it is it's like girl you're an amazon prime <laughs> show the call is coming from inside <laughs> the streaming service like really <laughs> And Amazon Prime is like, look at this amazing show we brought to you guys. Don't you just love it? It's like, <laughs> baby, don't you see? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, another great thing about Fallout. Like, you're right. Video game adaptations do tend to suck. Like, mm -hmm. they tend to be complete ass, especially because there have been a lot of them out coming out. Um, I think the most recent one was, like, Uncharted with... Yeah, oh, yeah, that was... Yeah, with Tom Holland and was it Mark Wahlberg? Yeah, because mm -hmm. they, they decided to do a prequel of it for some reason. I don't know yeah. why. Like the, Nathan Drake in the games is like a thirty-five-year-old man, but they decided to do it with like Tom Holland. I don't know what the thinking was there. I I don't understand either because you could have easily gone to like Jake Gyllenhaal or like any yeah. thirty-five-year-old white man in Hollywood that would be begging to be yeah. in the show movie. But you decided to get Tom Holland, who is not. I think I think he is yet to be in a good movie apart from Sp at least after the spider-man ones mm. yeah that's... and i only say that because i only say that because he was like when he was a kid he was in that like flood movie with ewan mcgregor mm -hmm. like, was that? that's i think it's that and then the spider-man some of the spider-man movies and then it's a struggle he's struggling out here i mean he's dating zendaya so it's not going too badly for him but i just mean like <laughs> filmography wise <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he is also going to be on Broadway um, in the oh, production yeah. of Romeo and Juliet. Mm. So, I mean, hopefully that gets some good reviews. There have already been people, like, having, you know, people being upset because Juliet is black, even though black people have been playing yeah. Shakespeare oh, wait, no, forever. It, this, yeah, exactly. And this is the West End one, isn't it? It's Kit Connor who's in the Broadway one. It's mm -hmm. Kit Connor and Rachel Zegler, and then Tom Holland's in the... Um, uh, yeah, the West End one. And to bring it back to Doctor Who, I know Freema Adjuman's also in it. She's the nurse. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's another production of Romeo and Juliet that's actually out, but I'm not sure where that's going to be like produced exactly, but there are three yeah. of them now. My God. I don't know why everyone decided to do Romeo and Juliet all of a sudden. I don't know. I feel like there's been kind of like a decline in like romance films recently, so like yeah. Maybe that's it, but also Shakespeare has so many works. We could do like um not not 
much ado about nothing we could do midsummer we could do yeah the tempest we could do so many i like, know we do, we do want to go do one of the like really deep cut ones like i want to see someone do like a timon of athens yeah that's what we're missing timon of athens a movie or something <laughs> like that like a symbol yes <laughs> like i love romeo and juliet love is you know a nice way of saying what i feel about that musical movie play damn words um <laughs> you know i like romeo and juliet it's solid it's something that everybody knows but also i you know i also like much ado about nothing because the one with um jillian anderson and denzel was absolutely flawless and oh yeah. if we could do another one because i know that david Tennant was also in much ado about nothing with Catherine tate like if we could oh that yeah, back, yeah please bring her back to the stage <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah but no they absolutely need to do that. they also need i'm such a i always think about the speaking of denzel the macbeth that he did the yes. tragedy of macbeth that was so good god come on guys shakespeare has so many plays i know well david Tennant actually he just did a macbeth as well he just he, he just uh, yeah in london somewhere i can't remember where but he just finished up uh doing macbeth like, actually i don't even know if he's finished but i know that like some of my friends went to see it that was like a really like minimalist production apparently i remember i used to follow this girl on tumblr who would go to all of david Tennant's like stage adaptations or like all of his like stage plays and really? hi when i was younger i was like oh she's so lucky hindsight now i'm like girl you're wasting your parents money what are we doing <laughs> all of them <laughs> like at least every time he was on stage she would go see him live yeah and as a parent, you have to ask yourself, why is my daughter obsessed with this old man? It's, yeah, that's true. It also seems like much more of like an undertaking than it actually is. I think it's basically she's just saying I go every sort of year. I go to one of like five theaters in London where they put on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like I understand the 10th doctor is your favorite doctor. That's great. I love that for you. But yeah, that much. Like, I know <laughs> my God. <laughs> I like David Tennant, but I can't even, like, I couldn't even get through, like, some of the series. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> it's a miracle I got through Broadchurch, considering what the fuck was going on at that show. But I only saw season one. Apparently, it, like, really fell off hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Season two was, like, a whole different beast to conquer, I have to say. Oh. Yeah. I don't think it was bad. But then again, when I watched it, it was, like, a while ago i was still in like the love the haze of like oh david Tennant is amazing and then david yeah. Tennant came back as like the 14th doctor and i was like what the fuck is going on <laughs> i know you've got other jobs i know you're employed sir. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's, su he's such a uh, massive nerd it's so every other doctor is like yeah i might come back you know if they ask me i'm not sure david Tennant is like <laughs> they, the bbc rings him up and he's like oh absolutely oh Oh, oh, bullshit. Oh, he's like, Good Omens 3, cancelled. I'm doing Doctor Who again. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also funny because, like, now there are two doctors in the universe. So, like, as the Chichi Gatwa goes on his adventures, yeah. we could most likely have a cameo by David Tennant, which is, like, fun. But yeah. also, do we need it? Like, also, yeah. Also, I love that they've, like, now built in just for David Tennant an explanation as to why, like, he'll get older when he, like, comes back. Oh God. no because very clearly he got older like the man's 50 now you know like he's not the spring chicken he used to be what are we doing yeah. but i digress that's fine it's fine um oh one last recommendation abigail uh in theaters now it is so good and Honestly, I love seeing movies, like I said before, where, like, I'm completely surprised by, like, what happens. And yeah. watching the trailer to Abigail, in my head, I'm thinking, like, hmm, this feels like I'm seeing the whole movie. But even though the runtime is not that long, a lot happens <laughs> in that movie. Because you have, That's... like... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I've seen, like, the name of the movie and I've seen the poster that's all i know about is she like a ballet dancer or something like that or is it like so the movie's about these uh seven criminals that kidnap this girl she's like the daughter of like a rich guy and they have uh, to like be in the house with her for like 24 hours to like ransom her and they find out that she yeah. is a vampire ballerina essentially. oh right 
Wow. So they have to survive. It's not 24 hours. It's actually 48 hours, I believe. But they have to survive in the house with her and not die or be turned. Right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, now that's a movie premise. What? <laughs> I did to say the movie is gnarly. Like it's uh, if you cannot do violence, blood, gore, don't watch the movie. All right. I'm just going to put that out there because once we get to the last 30 minutes, not even the last 30 minutes, the first kill in the film is like, it's really, it's really gnarly. It's really wow. bad. And the movie does not like do like the quick, like look at it and then turn away. It's like, that's in the frame. You need to watch the movie and be comfortable with the fact that like that's in that frame. So, Damn. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm fine with for the most part, but at certain points in the film, we got into like certain territory because it's a vampire movie. So of course it's going to be blood. And eventually I'm yeah. just like, I can't watch this anymore. I need a shower just looking <laughs> at this. I love, I, I, I love can't. That. <laughs> I love that our two rec our recommendations were like a nice like light sitcom and then two like, <laughs> extremely violent. <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, let's a little you know diversity, a little you know. Yeah, exactly. It's good to have a <laughs> mixture of genres. <laughs> Give people <laughs> options. You know what I mean? Like we don't know what you're in the mood for. Try it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You might like them, but um. Owen, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, well, thank you for having me. It's so wonderful to have you on. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at on my YouTube is or Owen. Uh, they can find me on. I, I haven't posted on TikTok in a while, but you can still follow me on TikTok. It's or Eugene. Um, I think my Twitter is still private. <laughs> I'll say it, it's zero r zero like w e n. So it's just or Owen, but with zeros. Um, yeah, and you can follow. Oh, and my Instagram is also or Owen, I'm pretty sure. And you can follow me in there and keep up with stuff. There is another video coming on YouTube before too long. I can, I can say it's a Doctor Who video, so everyone can look forward to that. That's my <laughs> other recommendation. It's my upcoming Doctor Who video. Guys, don't forget to check out Owen on all the social media, which we linked down in the description. Go check out his YouTube channel, or or Owen, right? Yeah, or or Owen. <laughs> Lots of people are confused about how to pronounce it, and at this point, I'm like, just say it however you want. <laughs> as long as you spell it right, it's whatever. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. When I first saw your channel name, I was like, oh yeah, that guy, or Owen. That one. Yeah, or Owen. I know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's fine. You know, it's a dealer's choice. <laughs> <laughs> but guys, uh, don't forget to check out uh, Owen's YouTube channel or Owen and subscribe to his YouTube channel as well. Don't forget to check out all of his socials linked down in the description down below. Don't forget to check us out on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, where we listen to podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends and family about your new favorite podcast, I Have a Me, to watch that. So happy to have you guys listening. Uh, we'll, we'll see you guys next week with new topic, new guests like we do every single week. Bye! Bye. <laughs>